My name is Mike Hamrick. I'm the Director of Athletics here at Marshall University. And what a beautiful day we have today. And uh, before we get the program started, and uh, uh, we'll have an invocation, and then I'll kind of talk a, just a few seconds about what this is about, why we started it, uh, what we're going to do. But first, I would like to uh, bring up Reverend Steve Harvey. He is our Marshall University football chaplain, and let uh, Reverend Harvey give the invocation. Steve. Get him up. Here we go. I want to see every L up in here. Okay, ready? Live it. That is sorry. My name really is Steve Harvey. It's about to get partied up in here. Live it. Love it. Loyal to it. Live it. Love it. Loyal to it. Now we can pray. Let's pray together. Lord, the psalmist said that uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So today, Heavenly Father, we're grateful and humbled that we can be a part of the Marshall faithful at this fountain ceremony. I'm certain today, Lord God, as we sit here, that we feel as though we've come full circle as sons and daughters of Marshall from the stillness and the solitude and the quietness of that November day where everything changed in an instant and time stood still to today in the spring season of life, a new birth. Once again, the water will be restored to the fountain, to this memorial. New hearts, new life, new hope, new dreams. God, I ask you to take care of the families represented here today former players, those who have lost loved ones, our friends of obviously the 2019 Thundering Herd, Coach Holiday and his players and staff, everybody involved in this new season of football. Lord, I want to take a second and just remember the, this time last year, we remember Reggie. What a blessing it was just to be a part of that day. And we miss him. But we go on. He would want us to go on. Pick up the pieces and go and get after it. It is good for us to be here. May this living water today, when it pours through that fountain, forever remind us that you said when we drink of this water, we will never thirst. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for extending your mercy and grace to us, Lord God, one more day. May we forever and always remember that we truly are. Marshall. And I pray for everybody here today, for our mayor as he speaks. I ask your blessing on our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go hurt. As many of you know, we have a fountain ceremony November 14th every year that draws thousands. And we pay tribute to, and we grieve, and we mourn the 75 people that we lost November 14, 1970. This ceremony was not intended to take the place of that, where we have three or 4,000 people crowd this area to come and hear about the 1970 football team. We're here today to celebrate the rebirth of Marshall football. In 1970, this university had to make a decision that I believe was the most important decision that was ever made at Marshall University. And that decision was to restart a football program that had been destroyed, had been dis devastated, a community that had lost everything. And that's the greatest decision, I believe, my opinion, was ever made at Marshall University. And we're here today to celebrate that decision and celebrate the rebirth and the commitment to Marshall football through the turning on of this beautiful fountain that the 75 pixels represent the 75 people that we lost in 1970. That's what we're here for today to celebrate. And 
The good Lord knows the success over the years that this football program has had and all the great players that have went through this football program and have, have benefited from the decision that was made to restart football. It was a great decision. We've won many championships. We've graduated thousands of players. Many of us, including myself, owe our lives to Marshall and Marshall football. So we're celebrating today, and that's why we're here. And this idea came up not from me, not from the university. When I first got here nine years ago, Coach Lingle and 15 or 20 members of the Young Thundering Herd asked to meet with me. And I met with them, and they said, we do not want to take anything away from our brothers that we lost back in 1970, but we want to do something to celebrate what happened after November 14th, 1970. And again, that was the rebirth of the program. So that's why we're here today. And as we know, we've had many, many great football players come through uh, Marshall University. And actually, we've had a couple of them here today that I would like to introduce. Uh, we have one of our greats here, Albert McClellan. And where's Albert? I see. Albert. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, Albert McClellan was a member of the New England Patriots Super Bowl championship this year. Yeah, brother. By the way, that was Albert's second Super Bowl championships, championship, and he promised me that he was going to break Troy Brown's record of five, maybe? Huh, Albert? Is that what you said yesterday? <laughs> Getting too old? Isn't it great? We've, we've had the, and this shows you where our football program has come from and where it's at. <clears throat> Excuse me, last year we had Vinnie Curry here, and Vinnie Curry was coming off a Super Bowl championship with the Philadelphia Eagles. So uh, that was a great decision in 1970. With that, Marshall made a great decision in hiring their, their next president. Uh, he's very supportive of athletics. He's very supportive of me and our coaches and what we do. And I would like to bring up our president, Dr. Jerome Gilbert, for a few remarks. Dr. Gilbert. It's a beautiful spring morning and a great day for a spring football game. I want to thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, I'm honored to be on this platform, to be here with the Rev and to be here with my athletic director and my good friend and the mayor, Steve Williams, we love Huntington. Today we parallel the rebirth of spring with the turning back on of our fountain. We've had some warm days on the plaza this spring and on one of those warm days I was out here on the plaza and a student came up to me and she told me she was missing the fountain, the waters of the fountain. And I think all of us have been longing for the waters of this fountain to come back on. It's been a long time since November 14th when we turned it off. This fountain ceremony this past November was the 48th anniversary of the tragic plane crash and this year will be the 49th. And the sadness of that memory still hangs very heavy with us still. This fountain is the central spot on our campus and it's more than just an ordinary fountain because it is of course a memorial fountain. And as I've said before, this plaza is transformed into a sacred place every November 14th and every day like today when we turn back on the fountain. We hold the memory of the 75 in our hearts today as we prepare to turn this fountain back on. The turning off and the turning on of the fountain is symbolic on several different levels. There is, of course, the natural following of the seasons when we turn off water features in the winter to prevent freezing. Uh, this is the symbolic hibernation and the death of the outdoor plants in the winter and then the rebirth of the plants in the spring. Then there's the symbolism of the passing of the lives of the 75 and the rebirth of their lives in heaven. And finally, there's that temporary thought of ending the football program, as Mike Hamrick mentioned, due to the tragedy and the restarting of our football program at Marshall. 
This fountain is symbolic of the cyclic nature of life and the resiliency of Huntington and Marshall University. The community and the university came together each year to recommit ourselves to perseverance and survival. We always know that when we suffer setbacks and temporary failure, that the spirit of Marshall University will prevail. We are a family that has known heartache and we have known sorrow, but more importantly, we know hope. We have experienced the unity and the strength of a family that stands together in good times and bad. We are all proud to be part of this Marshall family and to watch the waters of this fountain today as they remind us of that Marshall fountain. God bless each of you here today and may God continue to bless Marshall University. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it's a great honor for me to introduce our next speaker, our featured speaker, because we spent a lot of time together here at Marshall. Fairfield Stadium, uh, Steve and I were teammates, and I'm so happy that he's our mayor. Uh, Steve and I spent many of afternoons fighting with each other. Steve was a tight end and I was an outside linebacker. And uh, every day in practice, we would go head to head. And uh, I think that's why we became such great friends that we had such respect for each other and uh, we, uh, we were great teammates, and Steve was an outstanding player for the Young Thundering Herd uh, for the teams in the 70s. As you know, he's our mayor of Huntington. I've never seen a mayor anywhere I've ever been more committed to making a city great. And I believe Steve learned that right here at Marshall University and out at Fairfield Stadium on that football field. Steve called me and he said, and my nickname was Burley, and he said, Burley, he said, I got this idea. He says, we're gonna enter a contest and we're gonna make Huntington the America's best community. And I said, well, tell me about it. He says, well, there's gonna be about 350 communities all over the United States and we're gonna go in and we're gonna win $3 million and make Huntington America's best community. I said, Steve, <laughs> you have as much chance of winning that as you did of blocking me in those scrimmages. <laughs> and I was serious. I, I thought the guy was crazy. Well, guess what? 350 cities, Huntington won. And they won because of that man right there. And the mayor is, we announced, the president and I and the mayor announced about a month ago, a new baseball stadium. And it's something we need and we've needed forever. And it's gonna happen. It will happen. And we will make it happen. But without Steve Williams, we would have never been able to get the property that we needed to build this baseball stadium. And he has helped us from day one with that. Steve was a four-year letter winner here. He was a starter. He earned a bachelor's degree here in political science. Uh, I hate to admit it, he was a much better student than I was. Maybe that's why he's the mayor and I'm the athletic director. But um, Steve Williams loves Huntington, West Virginia. He loves Marshall University. And we together, and I see many of Steve and I's teammates here, and I wish I could recognize all of you and the members of the Young Thundering Herd, but uh, Steve and I went through a lot of tough times in the 70s. We, I, um, I hate to say it, we lost a lot of football games, but we, we kept the program alive and Steve was instrumental in doing that. And I think it's so appropriate that he is our speaker this morning. Let's give a warm welcome for our mayor, Steve Williams. Burley just said to me, now with that introduction, don't screw it up. <laughs> Dr. Hamrick, or Dr. Gilbert, uh, Reverend Harvey, 
Coach Doc, the coaching staff of the Thundering Herd football team, the players, the members of the Young Thundering Herd. What an honor it is to be able to be here to participate in, in this. This is something that's on checking off of the, the bucket list. Mike, you almost screwed up my speech. I started uh, thinking some of the things he's doing and I started getting fired up to kind of start talking about some other things. But Doc, one thing I learned from my dad when he was coaching, you put a game plan in place and just because some things happen in pregame doesn't mean that you change your game plan, right? Um, Reverend Steve uh, mentioned that this time last year, Reggie was, was speaking to us. We miss him. We never dreamed that that was going to be the last time that many of us would ever speak to him. I realized this morning when I was getting ready that I was starting to channel my inner Reggie. I had the white shirt, the cream pants, the pastel colors. I had to get the navy jacket on so that I wouldn't look like I was trying to copy after a Reggie last year because nobody can copy Reggie. But I can assure you this, I am not breaking out in a song of patches in the middle of this. I'm a son of Marshall, a proud son of Marshall. I'm so proud to be a member of the Young Thundering Herd. Everything I am and everything I ever hoped to be was shaped by the fact that I was a member of the Young Thundering Herd. My idols were players who stepped forward in 1971. Some I never got to play alongside, but I feel like we were teammates just the same. Mark Miller, Reggie, Nate Ruffin, Jack Crabtree, Rick Megstroth, all were guys that I looked up to. I was telling Mark a little story. Mark won the top GPA award for all of the, for the football team when he was graduating. And I was sitting out, I was a recruit, had just signed with Marshall, I was watching, I thought, I want to do that. Ended up graduating with honors, pressing with that. Uh, had a constant and lasting influence. So many of my teammates are here today. Those of you who know Bill Forbes, be careful. If you start to see him, his nostrils start to s spread a little bit, he's going to hit you. <laughs> I told you I'd tell him that. <laughs> One team teammate left a lasting impression. It left a lasting impression on, to me at what college football was all about. It's Alan Meadows. Raise your hand, Alan. <laughs> on, the first day, on the first day of pads and two-a-day practice, I was a skinny 180-pound quarterback, and they brought me down to run the offense against the starting defense. In the huddle, the coach called an option play, and the option meant that the quarterback had to fake a handoff to the fullback and then attack the defensive end and then decide whether you're going to run or pitch the ball. So I called the snap, faked the handoff to the fullback, head down, straight down to attack the defensive end, and I'm making a decision whether to pitch or to, to run the ball. And then all of a sudden, this big arm reached out and grabbed me all in one fell swoop, grabbed me by the jersey and slammed me down. And all of a sudden, I'm looking up, and there's this big shadow staring down at me, this big paw pushing down on my chest, and it was Alan Meadows. <laughs> and he looked at me in the eye, and all of that, all so quick, and it seemed so slow at this, this, all these years later, but pushed down on me and looked at me and said, welcome to college football, freshman. <laughs> <laughs> I came on this campus as a young man who just wanted to play football. They offered me a scholarship, and I was lucky to have my education paid for to enable me and allow me to play the game that I loved. Now, my family impressed upon me 
If I'm coming onto campus and I'm playing ball, I am a student athlete. Student first. Fact is, if they had pressed the matter, I would have paid them to let me play. I love playing that much. And I've tried to pay that scholarship back so many ways and so many different times during the years. All I wanted was to play. That's why I played so many different positions. Mike told you that I played tight end. Told you a little bit ago, I came as a quarterback, played wing back, played wide receiver. As, as a matter of fact, um, I'm not embarrassed to say Randy Moss broke all of my records. <laughs> By the third game that he ever played. <laughs> Chad had a much easier way. He broke my records too. In the first game against Chattanooga, third set of downs, he had beaten every record that I had. I was blessed to be a good athlete. And I understood the game because my dad was a coach. And while I played so many different positions, I came to understand that if you work hard, you be diligent, you'll find your way on the field and you'll learn ways, different ways to be able to contribute to the team. Interestingly, that pattern followed me throughout my, has followed me throughout my career. I've learned that being exposed to so many different disciplines prepares you to provide a unique leadership that not many others could provide. To be the right person at the right place at the right time. You may notice that we have displayed the team photo of the 1970 team. During my playing days, we saw that picture every day when we would come into the offices for meetings or to look at film. This framed photo hangs in my office behind my desk. It's the first thing anyone sees when they walk into my office. I also had this displayed on the stage when I was being inaugurated as mayor for the first time. I had it displayed during my inaugural to remind the citizens of the town that we had experienced difficulty and heartache and while we had experienced difficulty and heartache before, nothing was more difficult for our city to overcome with all the things that, we, that are challenging our community. Nothing was more difficult than to overcome having 75 people senselessly killed on a hillside outside of town. I reminded them that sitting among them in, at the, the inauguration were many of the families who had been left behind who had grown up to become leaders of our community. Many of them are here today. We were taken then to our knees and not only found a way to be able to stand again, but to stand and to move forward, holding on to the memory of those who passed. I have this picture prominently displayed in my office so I can tell those who are visiting our town that the picture represents the character, heart, compassion, and passion of the people of our community. If they want to understand our community, understand how the event of November 14, 1970 shaped our character. It defines us to this very day. If the person is from Huntington, then I use the photo to remind them of all that we've been through and that no difficulty is too enormous that we can't overcome. This ceremony is fitting for we honor those who perished on November 14, 1970. That chilly, rainy night began the winter of our community's discontent. That long winter beginning in November eventually gave way 
to spring. And in the circle of life, spring established a continuation. It re represented that from the pain of a dark, cold winter, life can proceed. The question that faced the Marshall community and the Huntington community in a very, also in a very personal way, the families of those who were lost, the question that hung in the air was how, how do we continue on? Life can be a cruel companion. We were learned that life is a demanding instructor that insists that we continue on. Coach Holliday speaks to his team about competitive excellence. A player never knows when his number is being called. And when his number is need, being called, he needs to be prepared to step up. But what happens when there isn't anyone left to call? What happens when someone can't be called upon to step up? Therein, within that answer, is the majesty of Marshall University and the greater Huntington community. The cruelty of that fateful night left a team without coaches to call upon, without seasoned players to call upon. It left a community without seasoned leaders to call upon. Yet that void left this university and this community to choose whether or not it was going to call upon the next person to step up, whether or not it was going to create an environment that would enable or allow the next person to step up. The question was much larger than whether a football program would continue. The real question was whether a community would stagnate in mourning or rise up and never forget because we never give up. That's the reason for today's, for today's ceremony to recall why we are here today and to celebrate those, celebrate that there were those who decided to step forward, decided never to give up. We are here to remember those 75 who were lost on November 14th, 1970, and we're here to celebrate those who stepped forward. We're here to celebrate those who chose to step forward because it provided us a lesson that lives through the ages. We will never forget because we never give up. When the plane crashed on November 14th, there were few immediately available to step up, few available to answer the call. What is the difference between Marshall and any other school in the nation? Every team has to reload the next year. Every team has a tradition to maintain based upon those who came before. But what's the difference between Marshall's football team and every other college team in America? The 1970 players, the young coaches, the community boosters all died, all died young. The football team could not reload. The program had to start from scratch. The community also had to start from scratch. The sad effect obvious effect of the crash is that we lost everyone. The much more sad effect is that none of the athletes, coaches, staff, or community boosters got to live to complete their mission. 
as a result, the contribution to society by 75 souls was lost. Those of us who were called to fill the void owe them a life of purpose and meaning. Those of us who were called in the years following reflect back with unimagined determination. We helped keep a program alive when people were clamoring for it to be discontinued. Yet we did so much more. In, in December 1987, Marshall was playing Appalachian State in Boone, North Carolina for the 1AA National Championship semifinals game. So many of us were there. The game was played on a wet, cold, dreary day. The herd won 24 to 10, and they were going to play in the national championship game in Pocatello, Idaho. And as I was walking out of the stadium, I bumped, bumped into three old teammates who I hadn't seen in over 10 years. It was surreal that we managed to find each other that day in that crowd at that time. It was Bob Birch, Fred Bader, and John Kravick. We ran into each other. I don't remember a word that was said. But our eyes met, tears dripping off our cheeks. And then we knew the purpose for our struggles in the 1970s. The program stood on our shoulders. We didn't have to stand in shame. We never forget because we never give up. Since then, I've come to understand that we all have a larger purchase of purpose of the relationships that we established from our collective experience. Nate Ruffin and I worked together to assure that the first African American was hired in the Huntington Fire Department in the history of the city of Huntington. I was able to leverage my position in the West Virginia legislature to assist in seeing that the Joan C. Edwards football stadium was being constructed to replace Fairfield Stadium. Eddie Hamrick, Mike's brother, and I worked together again when I was in the legislature, and Eddie was the director of the State Department of Natural Resources, and we worked together to advance the protection of our state's natural resources. Mark Mitchell helped me begin a life in finance that enabled me to change the lives of working people throughout Appalachia and the Midwest. And Mike Hamrick and I have found that through our lives' travels, we reach the point in our careers that we can together use our talents to assist our university, our city, and our state to achieve national prominence. We've all been able to do these because of an unspoken brotherhood and trust developed. We understand the fundamentals of how transformative leadership works. Trust, dignity, and integrity leave a strong legacy of opportunity to those who come after. These were the essential lessons for a group of young athletes to learn in order to be prepared to do great things that would be required of them in their ensuing years. As difficult as the days would be in the future, none would be as difficult as having to step in and fill a void of the promising future of the 75 souls. We don't come here to reminisce, to reminisce on how difficult it was. Nothing was as difficult as having to deal with the tragic event of November 14. We will never forget because we never give up. We come here to remember that when we stepped forward and answered the call to compete on the field left empty that November night, we answered the call to, to carry on in all our daily lives to attempt to fill the void to fill the void of those people who were expected to be teachers, doctors, attorneys, coaches, contractors, laborers, police officers, bankers, 
brokers, firefighters, community leaders, pastors, and everything that makes up a community. Life called each of us to serve our lives in honor of each person who was taken away too soon. Our calling included a call to leadership, leadership to be provided in numerous roles. The crucible of tragedy in which our calling developed helped us understand that leaders make hard decisions and then live with them. Leaders do not doubt, they only decide. Our days of development in the 1970s and the refinement in the decades since have prepared us as few have ever been. The challenge in our lives, in our communities, in our society revealed that we were prepared for a time like this. The young thundering herd is no longer young. We're comprised of teachers, coaches, administrators, lawyers, doctors, bankers, business leaders, pastors, laborers, and salespeople. We've reached the apex of our careers. We're seen as leaders, as visionaries and examples of dignity and integrity. We've won and we have lost. We've stepped forward and we've fallen backward. We've loved and we've cried. We've lived. We come to acknowledge that with the 1971 team and each team in the 48 seasons hence, we live to fill their void. It's being passed on year to year. The 2019 Thundering Herd football team carries on that tradition. We will never forget because we never give up. Men, the members of the 2019 team, know this. Once you take that jersey off for the final time, the ultimate competition of your lives will set before you. You will continue to be expected to defeat all who you can continue to compete against, not with brawn, but with finesse and mental acuity. Prepare yourselves. You're 31 points down at halftime, we never give up. You're in a three game losing streak, we never give up. A student athlete begins to have trouble with his grades and some classes, we never give up. A child makes a wrong decision and starts to head down the wrong path. We never give up. A community starts to suffer the ravages of drugs. We never give up. The economy comes to take hold of jobs and place an economic challenge on a university. We never give up. Players of 2019's team, Prepare yourselves. We are the bearers of history to prevent the past from being forgotten. We are the carriers of hope to, under, to overcome the indignity of despair. We are the source of solutions in a world that seeks assurance. We never forget who passed before us because we never give up. We are the members of the young thundering herd. We never give up. We are Marshall. We never give up. We never forget. We never give up. That's our call. That's our commitment. That's our passion. We never give up.
Before we turn to Fountain on, there's one other person I, I wanted to recognize. He's here, and he means as much to this university as, as anybody. He's a dear friend, and he means a great deal to me. Uh, Coach Red Dawson. Coach, stand up. Stand up. Well, it's the time we we're here for, but, but in closing, Marshall University football is the greatest comeback story of any athletic event ever. We talk about comebacks, being down two touchdowns, three touchdowns, four touchdowns, 20 points, this, that. There's nothing that has come back like the Marshall University football program. As we turn on the fountain, we honor all the student athletes who made the choice to wear the Marshall football jersey uniform in the years following 1970 and their contributions to Marshall University. Marshall University football players, current football players, today is your day. This is in honor of you. I'm just very fortunate to be a part of that brotherhood with all the players who've worn the Kelly Green. Can we now turn on the fountain?